Hello ladies and gentlemen, Smenny here, and welcome to my bedroom where all my video games reside. And here's a little bit more. And next to it is my TV with nearly every console I own attached to it. And also above it is the Simpsons stuff, which you should be familiar with if you watch the Hit and Run review from 2020. I don't exactly have a collection that rivals someone like other popular channels on YouTube, but my intention is to go after games I would actually love to play and or review, not just for the sake of collecting. Every single game and console or has a story whether it's the experience of the game in question or the actual physical copy. So let's just get straight into it with the console that introduced me to the world of video games. And that would be the Sega Mega Drive aka the Genesis. Firstly, this is not the one I grew up with. I don't know what happened to that one. I haven't seen it since 2003. But I got this one instead, and yeah, this is all the games I've got. It doesn't help that I got a few compilations on other systems, so I was less willing to get actual physical copies after I got the console. Fortunately, my brother likes to collect Mega Drive games complete in box, and there's only a couple I wish he had that he doesn't. Even though I don't use the Mega Drive that much today, I love this console, and I've always wanted to review or find some sort of excuse to play it. I did review the system back in 2016, but I can do so much better now. As for other Sega consoles, well, at the moment I don't have a Master System, Saturn or Dreamcast, so I don't have the same nostalgic memory for those systems. And a lot of the games I would have likely bought for them, I've got other ways to play them. For example, Sonic R on the PlayStation 2 via the Sonic Gems collection. I don't like it in case you're curious. Sonic CD, Daytona USA and Virtua Fighter 2, I've got those on the PlayStation 3. Another issue with the older systems, at least for a content creator like myself, capturing footage, that sort of thing, Composite is currently the best output, and it goes for a lot of the systems in my collection, particularly the Nintendo systems, the Super Nintendo, the Nintendo 64, and Wii. And to get the modder to output HDMI is more expensive than it's worth in my opinion. And let's not forget the PAL region color encoding is worse than NTSC standards, uneven resolutions and slower gameplay speed and frame rate. You might notice it on some of the recent PS1 and PS2 reviews on this channel. That's what makes these dedicated mini consoles so invaluable, a collection of proper classics outputting HDMI in 60 frames per second. That's why I don't have too many SNES games or NES games either. I've got exactly what I want from these. That said, I got the Super Nintendo in 2014, and yeah, this has literally been my collection since I got the system. Only good games, at least. Star Fox, Donkey Kong Country, Super Mario All-Stars, and Super Mario World. I also keep it shelved because some consoles are prone to going yellow, and I don't want to risk that happening to my system. Even though I haven't done much with the Super Nintendo on this channel, an early review of Donkey Kong Country and some on camera shots for console reviews, it's still pretty special to me because playing this console and getting into YouTube as internet was improving to a point where I could watch whatever I want. It was mostly gaming from the 90s and that motivated me to get back into the games I played as a kid and that in turn influenced me to create this channel and the rest is history. However, way back when I was a kid, I think I played the Super Nintendo only once, maybe twice if you can believe that. I hardly knew anyone who had an NES or SNES and because the Sega Mega Drive was the first console our family had, and after moving to the next generation we got a PlayStation and we weren't allowed to have more than one per generation. That's why I don't have the same level of childhood memories of Nintendo compared to a lot of you guys. With the exception of the Nintendo 64, thanks to family and friends I was able to jump between the PlayStation and N64 a fair bit back in the day. Mario Kart 64, Mario Tennis, and when my parents weren't watching, GoldenEye 007 were my favourite games on that console. But because I didn't have one at home, I didn't get a chance to properly play through the longer titles like Banjo-Kazooie or Zelda Ocarina of Time. Even if most games are showing their age, they're still fun to play today and I'm happy enough with my collection. The only thing I don't like is the controller, not the design per se, but the analog sticks easily prone to wear. I've actually started to get into some of the N64 titles developed by Rare, Banjo-Kazooie Zooey in particular, but I prefer to use the Rare Replay compilation because they're easier to play with an Xbox One controller. Again, thanks to family and friends, I partially grew up with the Nintendo GameCube. The earliest memory is playing Star Wars Rogue Squadron 2 Rogue Leader and Super Smash Bros. Melee, but despite that, I've never owned a GameCube. I borrowed one off a friend a while ago and reviewed a couple of stuff including Metroid Prime, Luigi's Mansion and the system itself. I even have a controller for one, the Super Smash Bros. version with a longer cable that coincided with the release 
of Smash Bros. Wii U. It's actually my favorite controller. The main problem is, again, the same narrative. Games for that console, as great as they are, they're massively overpriced. And like Sega, a lot of what I would have bought, I've got on other systems, including the Metroid Prime Trilogy on the Wii, Zelda Twilight Princess on the Wii, and Zelda Wind Waker on the Wii U. Basically, I'm not the kind of guy to have multiple versions of the same game, not even for the sake of a review. And speaking of these consoles, the Wii was the first Nintendo console in the family household. It's easy to forget how popular it was thanks to the motion controls. <laughs> However, before September 2020, this was literally my Wii collection. A couple of good ones, including Twilight Princess and Mad World, but I decided to bite the bullet and spend half a grand on a Nintendo Wii U that came bundled with a lot of good Wii and Wii U games. Ones that people would actually want to own. Super Mario Galaxy 1 Plus 2, New Super Mario Bros. Wii, Mario Kart Wii, and aforementioned Metroid Prime Trilogy. The latter especially is one of my prized possessions in my collection. And the Wii U, again, just the good stuff. No shovelware. I've probably put the most hours into Super Mario 3D World and Captain Toad Treasure Tracker. I really desperately want to play Zelda Breath of the Wild, but I just don't have the time to put in the massive hours required to get the best out of the experience. Not yet anyway, but I'm so glad it's in my collection. I feel as though there's nothing left to buy for that system. I got everything I've always wanted since I bought a Wii U a couple of years ago. Also, it's backwards compatible with Wii games, and thanks to HDMI capturing footage, it looks a lot better than composite. That's for sure. However, if there's one Nintendo console I remember pestering my parents constantly back in the day to buy for me, to no avail, it's the Game Boy. The Game Boy Color, to be more precise. And I was jealous of everyone that had one. The idea of being able to take actually good games on the go. All those long trips on holidays as a kid could have felt shorter. But better late than never, I guess. And this is my Game Boy collection. It's not that much, but I have Mario, Tetris, and Pokemon. The latter is not a reproduction cut. Enough said. In fact, writing this part of the script just made me decide to play some Pokemon Silver because I like Pokemon. For those who watched my channel way back in its infancy, you might be wondering what happened to all those other Game Boy stuff you reviewed back then? Well, like the GameCube, I borrowed all of it, and in hindsight, I should have kept it for myself. Honestly though, I don't think I'll get more than that because, again, the Game Boy family are Original, color, advanced games are too overpriced, especially complete in box. I'm more for just being able to play the game, so if there's anything beyond the realms of reasonable, I can just get it off the eShop for the Wii U or 3DS before it closes. And this brings me to the 3DS itself. Now, I got one of these only a month after filming for this video, very recently. It's another case of patience paying off. I got the whole bundle for a good price. It's in such good condition, and I use it almost every day, especially during work breaks. Playing mostly the Mario platformers, new Super Mario Bros, 3D Land, you can't go wrong with these. I just need to get a Pokemon and Zelda game, then I'm all set. So despite the content that usually gets the most views on this channel, your open world and racing game reviews, as you can see, I like Nintendo as well. I think it's only until I got a job outside this channel has this side of the collection started to take off. And no, I don't have a Nintendo Switch, not yet, since most of the stuff I want for that console I can just play on the Wii U anyway. Let's quickly look at the PC games. I managed to hold on to some of the older ones back in the day, Age of Empires 2, Roller Coaster Tycoon, The Sims, and V8 Supercars 3 were my favorites. The problem, at least with the physical copies, most of them aren't compatible with the latest Windows, like the first Sims or Need for Speed Underground. Although, to be truthful, I haven't really bothered to work it out, not yet anyway. Really, most of the games I got on the PC are on Steam and GOG, including Mafia, Halo, Max Payne, Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic, Battlefront, Wolfenstein and anything developed by Valve, so I'm not completely out of touch on the PC. After all, that's what's required to make these videos. Okay, let's move to the Sony PlayStation. Like the Mega Drive, I honestly don't know what happened to the PS1 I had in 2000. I really don't know. Maybe it was lost in a caravan in the mid-2000s since as a family we always brought it with us, and at the time, it wasn't a big deal once I got a PlayStation 2 which was backwards compatible with PS1 games anyway. Fortunately, my cousin was kind enough to actually give this to me since he never used it anymore, which I almost immediately used to review the system back in 2016. It's amazing how much more 
special these consoles feel when they're the same ones you actually grew up with instead of the ones you decide to repurchase. The first time I ever saw a PlayStation, it was this very model from the 1990s. Anyway, I only started getting a few physical games completing their jewel case just as PlayStation collecting was getting too expensive, so I don't have too many. Mostly racing games, Gran Turismo, Colin McRae Rally, Formula 1, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, and the rest including Metal Gear Solid, Castlevania Symphony of the Night, Crash Bandicoot, and Spyro the Dragon, I bought them all on the PlayStation Store. I know there's no guarantee they'll be there forever, but one advantage of the digital version is being able to copy them onto the PlayStation Vita so I can play these classics on the go. And I've put a lot of hours into these games this way, particularly Symphony of the Night and Crash Bandicoot 3 Warped. Like any system that flops commercially, the games, no matter how good they are, become overpriced well beyond the point of common sense, which is why my Vita collection is pitiful to say the least. Killzone Mercenary, a very good shooter, especially for a portable system. A Vita port of Minecraft, even though I never really played it, which is why it looks like I don't know what I'm doing. And FIFA Football, which has all the teams, stadiums, and game modes intact from its home console counterpart, which is pretty impressive. And since I bought the PS3, HD remaster compilations of the Ratchet and Clank and Jack and Axter trilogies digitally, I was able to copy them onto the Vita as well, so there's a lot available on this 8GB memory card. I also downloaded Grand Theft Auto, Chinatown Wars and Gran Turismo both on the PSP, and I definitely want to review both of these, and just recently Twitch streamer and content creator Lance McDonald is letting me borrow this PlayStation TV so I can use it to review these games in the future. Next to PlayStation 2, the first time I saw one was in 2002 at a birthday party and it was Gran Turismo 3 A spec. I think I've already said enough about that game recently, but it would be another four years until we got one in the household, just before the overpriced PlayStation 3 was around the corner. I remember feeling absolutely stoked. It came bundled with V8 Supercars 2, NBA Live 06, Crash Bandicoot, The Wrath of Cortex, and Tony Hawk's Underground 2. And yeah, this is the same PS2, a silver slim, which I still use to record gameplay whenever the PC SX2 emulator wets its pants even in software mode. Although even when it was new, it struggles with dual-layered DVD games, including Midnight Club 3, Dub Edition Remix, and Gran Turismo 4. It's a matter of chance that it loads the disc because they're such large games. My favorites during the 2000s include Grand Theft Auto San Andreas, Gran Turismo 3 and 4, Need for Speed Underground 2, and Tony Hawk's Underground 2. But it's when I started this channel and PS2 games were at their cheapest did this collection start to take off. That and because they were bought specifically for a review on this channel. I know I don't have all the recognizable PS2 classics, your God of War, Ratchet and Clank, Jack and Daxter, but that's because I have the remastered versions, which funny enough cost more to buy today than getting all the original PS2 versions collectively, but what is currently my largest game collection for one console is the PlayStation 3. I got a PS3 in 2009, the first console I bought with my own money, and because of that, this was the point when I started treating my games like they're God's gift to the earth. It also introduced me to high definition at home, and it took me a while to figure out how to implement it. For a few months, I used the RCA cables it came bundled with. Yeah, PS3 games in composite, a true crime indeed. Then I went to my cousin's place to play the same game and noticed how it looked a million times better despite having the same console, and that's when I realized it was this cable I should have been using the whole time. Give me a break, I was a young teenager who didn't know better. I originally had this slim model, but it stopped reading games properly five years later and I got this super slim replacement which came bundled with The Last of Us, a brilliant game I might add, and it's lasted nearly twice that length without issues. And it's got a larger hard drive too, particularly helpful considering I was just getting into buying games digitally. Another reason there are so many PS3 games here is because throughout the late 2010s there was, and still is, a stretch where PS3 games are only 5 bucks each, and got a lot of good ones at bargain prices as a result including the God of War Collection, Ratchet and Clank both Tools of Destruction and A Crack in Time, Formula 1 Championship Edition or Gran Turismo 6, all of these exclusives that I managed to get for peanuts. It's likely the console I've put the most hours into than any other, it was practically my life outside of high school. And there are so many great games to choose from, even if graphically they're slowly starting to show their age, at least in comparison to the Xbox 360, thanks in large part to how complicated it was for developers to make games for it. Now the PlayStation 4 was a system I got in 2015 as a Christmas present for myself and really wanting to review games from that generation at the time. I honestly don't have too much to say about it other than I love it. I put plenty of hours into a lot of the best games of the 8th generation on this console, especially Red Dead Redemption 2, it's one of my top 5 all time favourites. 
However, my PS4 collection in comparison is nowhere near as big. I think being a game reviewer during when I bought the PS4, it meant I was putting in time for other systems, so there wasn't as much of a need to have a huge library here. And also because I was studying at university at the time, making practically no money, there was a brief stretch where I was borrowing more games for reviews than actually having my own copy, including Uncharted 4, Ratchet and Clank reimagining The Order 1886 and Crash Bandicoot Insane Trilogy, and since I beat them all, I didn't have a motivation to get my own copies after that. And when the collection eventually built up a bit, being a workaholic adult, there are some that I'd get them thinking, I'm gonna enjoy this, and then forgetting about them because lack of time. Though I really have tried with some games, like I put a few hours into Crash Bandicoot 4 recently, I'm halfway through the remastered version of Ellie Noir, and I've nearly completed Spider-Man. They're all good games, and you should have them in your collection. We're also currently at this phase where games for this generation are dirt cheap, especially with Sony and their PlayStation Hits lineup, allowing you to get brand new copies of some of the best titles for the PS4 for cheap. But again, it's about how much time I have. You can say that about a lot of the games in my collection. That, and I also got an Xbox Series X recently, which by default makes the Xbox One versions of non-exclusives better technically, so I'm more inclined to get that version over the PS4 version. And speaking of Xbox, normally when I typically show the game's cover in a review with the shelf of games shown in the background, well just below it, that's where my entire Xbox collection resides, original 360, One and Series X. I definitely have fond memories of the original Xbox thanks again to family and friends, Rally Sport Challenge and Star Wars Obi-Wan were the first games I played, but I never had one and most of the well-known classics, particularly Halo Combat Evolved and Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic, I had those on the PC so I didn't feel like I was missing out not having an Xbox. In fact, at the time of this video, I still don't actually own an original Xbox, if you can believe that. So I used the backwards compatibility from the 360. I know it's not the most stable way to play them, as you can see, but in the PAL region, 480p doesn't exist without fully modding it, so this is the best output I can get as a reviewer. I'm willing to overlook the emulation issues for sharper gameplay. It took me until late 2018, nearly four years after I created this channel, to have an Xbox 360 next to the TV. That's why I went on a long stretch of reviewing nearly everything on that system, original and 360, I was so eager to use it. And like the PlayStation 3, I got a lot of these games dirt cheap. Obviously racing games being popular on this channel, it makes up for nearly the whole collection. Feels good to finally have all the Halo games, and I just got the Splinter Cell sequels a week after filming for this video. Another set of games I really want to review in the future. And looking at the 360 collection, I got roughly 60% of them in one random bundle for about 20 bucks, and that was really cheap, even if there are a few that I'll most likely never play. My favourites include Forza Motorsport 4, Horizon 1, and Project Gotham Racing 4. Yeah, mostly racing games. Like, it'd be easy for me to also say Gears of War or any of the Halo titles, but again, since I had a PS3, I haven't given these a proper go to make a final judgement. That's why a lot of these best third party titles on the 7th generation, yeah, Mass Effect, Grand Theft Auto, Portal, Red Dead Redemption, since I got a PS3 a decade earlier, I got those masters pieces on that system. Nothing wrong with that, just pointing out why my collection is like so. I was a PlayStation guy for a long time and whenever a new system was on the market, like when I was a kid I could only afford to get one system, and there was no justification in spending hundreds of dollars on a few exclusives. So like the 360, I also skipped the Xbox One throughout the peak of its popularity. That is, until I got my hands on an Xbox Series X. This video might as well be a mini review of this console because I have a lot to talk about here. I got it a couple of weeks before Christmas last year, and I told myself to wait until Christmas Day to actually open it up and make that unveiling that extra special. And it was. In fact, what you're looking at now is that Christmas Day opening. At the time of this video, I don't have a TV nor capture card that can capture 4K gameplay, but it's good to have a system prepared for when I can. Not only that, but the backwards compatibility. This is the main reason I picked the Series X over the PlayStation 5. Having four console generations in one go is invaluable. It means I don't have to buy an Xbox One, I can just use this, and then some. And because it improves the performance of previous generation titles, whether it's increasing the frame rates or removing the screen tearing, it's giving me the motivation to go through a lot of the games I reviewed in the past and record way better footage whenever I need it. Sometimes it's better to go back to what you already own and remember what made them masterpieces in the first place. You need a reminder of why you love video games and don't want to lose it. And once you become an adult, time is the most priceless thing in the world. 
This is my collection so far, Xbox One and Series X, plenty that I haven't even put in the console yet, but again, lack of time and extra focus on reviews. I was going to say that Forza Motorsport 5 and Horizon 4 were the only games left in the franchise missing in my collection, but during the making of this video I finally got them, which means there's no other Xbox One or Series X game left to buy. Like the Wii U, it feels like I got everything I want, at least until I played all these games multiple times or if it's a Patreon request. I guess that's the plus side of skipping the Xbox One. The games for them are also very cheap at the moment. Most of these were less than $10 each. Yeah, I think you're starting to see the pattern when I talk about these consoles. That's how my collection has been built over the last few generations. I decide what I want and wait until it's cheap because I've obviously got a lot to catch up on in the meantime, and I try to save money as best as I can. Honestly, I've only bought a game when it was released on launch day only three times over the last 10 years. However, this mindset can also be a double-edged sword because you could easily find yourself buying a game and or console because there's a risk later down the line it could get more expensive. It tends to be a theme whenever a previous generation passes. Nothing ridiculous, but it's noticeable. And another similar reason, games, particularly the sought after ones, being delisted digitally. And therefore, the original physical copy becomes expensive to the point where, no matter how good it is, it's not worth it. Most of the time it's due to expired licenses, like a soundtrack for example, but it's been a real talking point over the last 12 months. Basically, game preservation is another motivator for buying something, and even from that perspective, there's a higher risk of losing a digital copy when servers close. Like, should something happen to a game console, you lose the game and you can't download it back. It can be very stressful sometimes. I think the most important piece of advice I can give from looking at my own collection, I know a lot of people say this, but it's true. Only buy a game if it's one you actually want to play. Because that's what video games are made for, to be experienced. They're pieces of entertainment like puzzles, movies, or music. I like to think of games as an interactive combination of all these things. Literally every part of my life, video games have always been around in some shape or form. And all the stuff I can only dream of owning as a kid, for the most part, it's a reality now. Of course, there could have been a risk of losing interest growing up while the collection continued to build. That nostalgic spark that went off in 2014 could have easily died off. It is part of growing up after all, but I still love this stuff. I still love to talk about it, and I see this channel as a way to talk about it in the highest detail possible with the whole world tuning in. Genuinely, it feels like I have at least 98, 99% of everything I always wanted. I feel like anything else I buy after that is more likely going to be for review purposes. It's easier said than done, but I do have to slow down eventually, especially when I only really have time to play games for a review. I'm running out of space, and I'm currently in the process of having my own house. I just bought a block of land last year. Anyway, I wanted this tour to be more than just snapshots of everything I got, but to also look around and reflect on literally decades of memories and remind myself why I love video games. It's easily the largest gaming nostalgia trip I've had making a video. And going through this stuff, even for the parts to film for this video, it made me realize the magnitude of the amount of stuff I have on these shelves. It beggars belief. In conclusion, I want to thank all of my family and friends for letting me borrow their gaming stuff for the videos on this channel over the years, or even straight up giving them to me. Color Shed couldn't have reached over 100,000 subs without you guys, as well as you guys for watching this video. Thank you. And a special thanks to supporters on Patreon, including Alex Fidel, Bibbs, Brittleback, Cooper Munn, Darcy McIntosh, David Myers, Eric Barboza, Ian Walker, Jerry Thomas, Kez BFZ, Mike Camilli, Moak Bell, Ruffian Shark, Short, and VXL. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, click the notification bell, support on Patreon, follow on Twitter, Facebook, and speak to you soon.